Good afternoon. My name is William Nordhaus. I'm a professor at Yale University. What I'd like to talk to you about today is new approaches for cooperation to slow global warming. The four topics I'd like to mention today are these. First, there's been very slow progress in climate policy. Secondly, the main issue from an economic point of view is, is that carbon prices or emission prices are much too low. A third point is the inadequate investment in carbon technology, low carbon technologies. And finally, and most important, that free riding has been undermining climate agreements around the world. We'll start with the climate policies and their ineffectiveness. This graph shows the trends in what is known as decarbonization around the world. This is the world carbon output ratio over time from 1990 to 2019. And what this shows is that the rate of decarbonization or the carbon output ratio, the CO2 emissions output ratio, has been declining steadily at a little under 2% per year. But the most interesting thing about this is that there's been no change in this in recent years, where the trend in carbonization or decarbonization is roughly unchanged. So what this suggests is that the carbon policies that we've devised, both as nations and internationally, have not been effective in bending down the curve as much as we would need to reach our aspirations and the international agreements that we've reached. So this is the world excluding China. Let me show you the Chinese situation. China is, of course, the world's largest emitter, but it also has been declining much more sharply, whereas the rest of the world has been declining at about 2% a year in its carbon ratio, in its CO2 emissions to output ratio. China has been declining at almost 4% a year. And the other interesting thing about China is that in the last few years, since, since 2012, the ratio has been declining at almost 6% a year. So China is decarbonizing faster, but it also has further to go. This graph shows you the emissions of CO2 equivalent, the carbon dioxide equivalent. That's carbon dioxide and other gases like methane. And it shows you on the far left the history in the first two uh, dots, and then the projections under different scenarios. And as you can see, with current policies, emissions would continue to rise over time by maybe 15 billion tons a year by 2070. And on that trajectory, we would have also global temperatures rise, continue to rise sharply. So the basic idea I'd like to get across here is we're making progress, but not sufficient to meet our targets. Now, the next point I'd like to emphasize is the role of carbon pricing. The main contribution of economics to climate change and climate change policy is to emphasize the importance of pricing the emissions of carbon dioxide and other gases. Put differently, it's that a high price on these emissions is the key to sharp emissions reductions. The reason is pretty straightforward. As emissions, as the price of the emissions rise, then companies will change their technologies, say from burning coal to renewables, or from driving gasoline-powered cars to electric cars, or perhaps reducing their activities in high emission CO2 or high carbon technologies and high carbon sectors. So that's the absolute key to sharp emissions reductions. This carbon emission price should ideally be the same in different countries and different sectors. It shouldn't be high in one sector and low in another, or high in one country and low in another. And what we found is in much history of regulation, not just in energy, but in other areas, that fiscal approaches such as taxes or prices on emissions are much more efficient and much more effective than regulatory approaches that say, do this or don't do that. Now, I would say, but, if we look at the landscape of carbon pricing, 
what we find is in fact, carbon prices are highly fragmented around the world. And they're also very low. So whereas the target price might be in the range of 50 or $100 a ton to meet our objectives, the average carbon price in 2020, according to the World Bank, was about $3 a ton of CO2. So if we were to meet our objectives, our temperature objectives, or perhaps not quite such, so ambitious an objective, maybe instead of two degrees or two and a half degrees, or even three degrees, we would need very high carbon prices relative to what we have now. We would need a minimum of $50 a ton of carbon price, of emissions price, and we might need as much as $150 a ton to meet the most strict targets. But we're not there yet, we're not even close. The third point is the importance of technologies and in investments in low carbon technologies. So just to back up a little, one of the interesting and important points about innovation is that there is a big gap between the public return to innovation and innovative activities, research and development, and the private return. So even though private inventors private firms that do research and development may earn profits, the public return on that is much greater. And if we see this, we can look, for example, at the returns in terms of health and safety and economics to the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines, which are very great. The World Bank has estimated that the vaccines are saving us in the order of $500 billion a month but the returns to the inventors, the firms that did these vaccines, is only a fraction of that, maybe 10% of that, maybe 5% of that. And that's a pervasive fact across all forms of innovation, whether it's pharmaceuticals or computers or chemicals or different areas. But the fact is, this is even worse for environmental goods and services because it's what we call a double externality for low carbon innovations. Because not only you have this gap that you normally have for innovation, but you also have the benefits of low carbon innovation are underpriced because of the low price on carbon dioxide emissions. But in addition, we need special incentives for low carbon technologies. We need special incentives that reflect the fact that this is a particular priority. One of the ways to meet these is through public funding of research and development. And all governments do public funding of research and development in different areas, in health, in energy, in military, and in many other areas. But what we see, if we look for the United States, I'm not showing other countries here, but just for the United States, is a very, very distorted set of priorities relative to the need for carbon technologies. And this shows that um, U.S. federal research and development fundings for 2020 in billions of dollars, and it may be a little hard to read, but as you can see, the line on the left is the total uh, in the hundreds of $150 billion. And then the three big ones, big areas, uh, are military and health, and then the other but if you look at that little tiny bar on the right is the federal funding for low carbon technologies, for renewable technologies, and for um, fundamental research in energy. It's about $2 billion a year. And so what you can see here is an example of very badly distorted priorities, even though the president and other political leaders have said that it's a very high priority to improve technologies we're not putting our research and development dollars into that. And so this needs to be a big improvement, not just in the United States. Now, the final topic I want to mention today is the role of international policy. Now, we've, we've just finished the uh, conference of the party in Glasgow. It was the 26th conference of the party, it would go back almost 30 years. But the fact is, when we look at this, international policy is really at a dead end. Climate change and the way it is uh, happening is being hampered. International climate policy is being hampered by what's known as free riding. 
And in this area, unlike many other areas, the international agreements are all voluntary. So countries can agree to them if they want to, and they can ignore them if they want to. Uh, and this is really a penalty. It's, it, it's uh, because they're voluntary and there are no penalties for non-participation. Now, we have thought uh, at Yale here and around different areas about using different policies to overcome free riding. And what effective policies require is uh, new incentives that I call a climate club, that they have both carrots and sticks. And so a climate club, as we've th thought of it, would involve a regime with two features. One would, going back to what we talked about earlier, one feature would be that it has a target carbon price, perhaps $50 per ton of CO2 emissions, that all countries who are participants in the club must meet. But it also has penalties on those who are not participants or who fail to meet their objectives. And it might be something like a 3% penalty tariff on the imports from the non-club into the club region. So let me, uh, let me just review then for you what, what we've had today and to put a little bit in perspective as we go along. The first point I want to emphasize is how little progress we've made to date on slowing warming. We've made very little progress in terms of bending down the curve of emissions. It's been declining in the globe roughly at 2% a year, but it needs to decline. It's been sorry, declining at about 2% a year, but we need it to decline much more sharply if we're going to meet our objectives, at least 4 and up to 6% a year. So we need to have much more rapid decarbonization if we're going to reach our international agreements. Now, one way to meet that, and economists emphasize one of the most effective ways, is through high and harmonized carbon prices, or high and harmonized prices on CO2 emissions, or more generally, on the emissions of greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and other harmful chemicals. And that will allow us to tilt our economy to tilt the playing field away from using these greenhouse gases, away from climate change, toward slowing climate change. A third point I've emphasized is the importance of low carbon technologies in meeting our objectives. The fact is that if we're going to meet our objectives, we're going to have to roll over a very substantial part of our energy infrastructure. And it also requires new technologies to meet those that we're going to have to we're going to have to invent, we're going to have to innovate, we're going to have to develop, we're going to have to commercialize, and we're going to have to make them very large scale. The final point on the international agreements is to recognize that the current approaches to international climate policy are a dead end. They're a dead end because they are voluntary. And so countries who benefit will join them, and countries for whom they're costly can drop out. We need a plan in which there are incentives, carrots and sticks, for countries to join the climate club. And this would, we call this a climate club because it is something where you set an effective policy, such as a carbon price floor for all countries, but you combine that with incentives for countries to join, say through tariffs for those who are not compliant. So that's a summary of what the current state of international agreements and climate policy looks like from the status of economics and the social sciences and the policy sciences, also from the point of view of what we need to do. So I hope you enjoy the conference. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, uh, but that's, uh, that's it for today. Thank you and goodbye.